started. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce our second uh, and final lecture today. Uh, we do a tutorial. Um, Aman Steele's came with many interests. Uh, they're also uh, strong interest in uh, fluid dynamics. And uh, it's a good to find uh, key insights into problems. Uh, you've made some uh, significant insights into uh, turbulence and very bad. And we thought it would be very, very uh, nice to have this, uh, this area of interest that we represented in these lectures. And we will invite <coughs> uh, Detlef uh, agreed to do this lecture on this topic. Detlef uh, joins us from the University of Fuente uh, in the Netherlands, where he runs a considerable effort of fluid dynamics that spans all the way from nano bubbles uh, to fully developed turbulence uh, of different kinds. Uh, he's received many awards over the years. Spinoza Prize and Netherlands uh, Bachelor Prize. Uh, he's an expert on all things fluid dynamics, but today has agreed to give an introduction to a topic that is close to some of Bill's work, which is uh, turbulence, and we're delighted to have him here Well, well, thanks a lot, uh, William. For the introduction, kind of action, and uh, for having me here and giving me the opportunity uh, to speak on turbulence, and also thanks for Tom and Heinrich and my, and my for the organization of this uh, workshop here. Um, so, where there are anterograde turbulence, um, these can be seen as the two prosocia of physics of uh, fluids. Uh, so, where there are a container heated from below and cooled from above. I need to transform it and tell a pair. Uh, two coax are of cylinder, uh, and either co rotating or counter rotating. And what's transported here is angular velocity. And these two, two systems are beautiful because <coughs> they're closed systems, they have global balances, and they are mathematically well defined. Uh, and Leo loved this, this, these two systems, these two systems, in particular, he loved Bradley and Bernard. And he asked many questions to this relevant R system. Uh, so, uh, one of the questions is on the interaction between the turbulent bulk and the bottleneck. It's in both cases, uh, it's a close interaction between the dynamics going on in the bottleneck and the bulk. They affect each other, and the question is how is that? So, the first question Leo asked was what is the flow of orientation? Drew this picture here, he was very proud that he got a new apple. Uh, and he uh, <laughs> drew this on the top of the old drawing. Uh, and he asked, well, How does the flow organize? Then he also asked, What is the heat transfer? What's the Luffel number? I will define it later. So here you have the Luffel number, here you have the radar number, this is the response, and this is the driving. What is the scaling here? And those days, people thought that the Luffel number would scale like radar to the and the third uh, question was, uh, is there some half-turbulent regime? So here there is some dissipation, and here is a relay number, and what is seen in this data is that there is some reduced dissipation uh, around 10 to the left. Well, it turned out to be much later, it turned out to be other factors in the of the probe. Uh, the, what could be achieved those days, and these are experiments for which are very, you could go up to 10 to the 13, uh, and well, this was considerable. This was the effort of Chicago in the early 90s. And this uh, led, among many others, to the very famous paper, which had a huge impact on the American art community. So it's called the Chicago 9, with these nine answers, they uh, here, uh, alphabetically. And the uh, theoretical effort was led by Leo Kerloff and the experimental effort by Albert Chabert. Um, and uh, up here you see, in fact, Leo on the occasion of the conference we had in his honor for the 70s to his birthday, uh, and in fact, you should have this also there. Um, so let me define the problem. It's, it's shown here. Container, heated from below and cooled from above. Um, it has material properties uh, with viscosity, thermal diffusivity, and beta. Into the thermal 
suppression coefficient, so density depends linearly on temperature. Hot stuff normally goes up, and you will see the linear expansion here. And what you also assume is that the other material parameters are independent of the temperature. You can expand this, but to, to get the essentials is not necessary. But what will happen in response uh, to this heating here is that you will uh, get a large scale convection role characterized by U, also called wind of turbulence, uh, and uh, you will get a uh, So the governing equations are given here. It's a non Stokes equation with this extra driving, thanks to the heating. Uh, it's the advection equation for the temperature field theta, and of course the assuming composability. The boundary conditions are you no know, uh, slip at the walls, and at the bottom you have delta, at the top uh, you have uh, So the non-dimensional control parameter of the system is the non-dimensional temperature difference between top and bottom, delta here, non-dimensionalized in the proper way. And the primal number, which is the ratio between kinematic viscosity and thermal visibility, and then the geometric parameter, the aspect ratio, the width, over the <coughs> and well, you already see the numerical simulation, and you also see the problem, it's a multi-scale problem. You see many, many small scales here, detaching from the boundary layer. You see this large scale, this large uh, things which develops. This, by the way, it's three-dimensional simulation, and 10 to the 12th, uh, and I'll come back to this later. Uh, you also see what Nigel was uh, uh, teaching. In the beginning, this multi scale problem, and the idea in the turbulence was to get the scaling of the velocity structure function and of the spectra out of some normalization group. In fact, my, when I started my PhD in 1990, my task assigned to me by my PhD advisor, Dietrich Grossman, was to solve the normalization group. <coughs> Transformation problem for turbulence. And uh, well, I, I tried this for five months and then I figured out that I'm not smart enough. And I'm glad I have figured it out in time because it's still not solved. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I had stuck to the subject, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here now. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, I think that what you must also when things uh, are beyond your own capacity, one quality is also to recognize that they are. And then you but I, I, I moved on to other things. So, uh, well, this is, these are the control parameters, and what is the response of the system? The response of the system is the Nusselt number, which is the dimension of the heat transfer, so the heat transfer over the conductive heat transfer, and the Reynolds number, and they depend on Rayleigh, Prandtl, and the aspect ratio in some way. By the way, this is also some textbook example for this Buckingham Pi theorem on how to translate dimensional variables in, in non dimensional so these are the response parameters of the system. But the question is, how do they depend? Uh, well, the Nussel number is defined here. Uh, here is the convective part, and here is the diffusive part, normalized by the purely diffusive heat transfer. And up to 70 or 8, in the Rayleigh number, we have no flow. Uz is 0, and then this guy vanishes, and then you immediately see that the Nussel number is 1. If you read the temperature of the fire, everything is boring. And we will be in the regime much, much larger than this onset. So here you see the onset, Nussel <coughs> versus Rayleigh at 1708, independent of Frankfurt. This, by the way, uh, one of the uh, first calculations of uh, linear stability analysis. Uh, and it's only 1929. The original paper was 1928, but those days there was no computer and there was, in fact, a algebraic error in this paper. And we had to write the error to correct the number here. But you no, know, it's pretty late, it's 1929. In this sense, it's uh, fluid dynamics, it's more modern than quantum mechanics. I mean, quantum mechanics was in the 20s. This uh, linear stability is 1929. And well, when you go higher than the value number, you get these rolls, you get power formations. Uh, and it's very relevant for various applications in the atmosphere here, in the ocean in the mantle and also in the core of the Earth. And we had a lot of collaborations also in astrophysics uh, here with Bob Rosner and his group uh, on uh, heat transport. Um, also the climate is of course extremely relevant <coughs> to understand the flow patterns of heat transport. Um, for the 
reverse for the core in the, uh, in the Earth, there are reversals of the magnetic field, which are ascribed to reversals <laughs> in the uh, flow in the inner core of the Earth. And, uh, well, you can't look there, but you try to look at some toy problem to understand the nature of these reversals, and this uh, toy problem is very nice. I will go into this first, and uh, to go to the essentials, I'll show you this two-dimensional simulation here. Um, so here from below, pull from above, in this box, and what you see here is the flow is going around like this, like that. But from time to time, you see a reversal, right now, and now it goes the other way around. So, uh, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that this corner flow is building up, so it's driven by these plumes, detached plumes, it's a fat, you see it's growing, 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 as mentioned last time, it's fat, and at some point it's large enough that it can take over and has this reversal. Uh, there is uh, some, uh, some randomness in this, uh, whether this will make it or whether it won't make it. Uh, it's extremely interesting dynamics of this. Um, well, Leo uh, kind of has uh, seen what's going on here. And well, you will see that he grew it like this. It turned out to be in fact like this. So the tilting was not in this direction, but the tilting was in this direction. But it's a little detail. And the, uh, the essentials that these plumes detach and drive the flow that, that he has seen and that they have been used uh, well, these plumes are real, so you can see an uh, experimental visualization of the plumes with uh, liquid crystals, but they are calm here. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, the overall dynamics depends uh, very much on the control parameters. So now we go higher and higher number, uh, and gamma is 1. And what we see here is there are no reversals whatsoever. The average time is huge, in very long calculation, and no reversal whatsoever. And it turns out that whether there is a reversal or not really sensitively depends on the uh, parameters. So here you see the parameter space, Rayleigh versus Crumble, and red means there is a reversal, and the original movie I showed you was right there. But when you go up in Rayleigh number, uh, or a Crumble, or to go down in Crumble, uh, these reversals vanish, so in all three directions, and you want to understand the transition when this is happening. And by balancing terms in the equations, whether this, the heating uh, of these vortices, these corner flow vortices, can build up or whether they can't, you can really argue why you have reversal in some cases and why you don't. Uh, so, the whole thing unfortunately depends pretty much on geometry. So, here you have gamma as 1. Uh, and when you go down to gamma as 0.85, the situation is very different again. The layer wouldn't have light, it's non universal. I mean, it really depends on details of the interaction with the boundary layer, um, and uh, it matters quite a bit what it is. Excuse me, it's not three diagrams, is it three dimensional or two dimensional? Uh, that phase diagram is two dimensional for that case. Uh, and two dimensional is different again. Yeah. Um, well, here this is quasi two dimensional, <coughs> here, and uh, well, here you see indeed uh, that uh, both in experimental experiments by Christian Schaff and his group, and also in this numerics, you, you find the sub reversals and the you know, statistics uh, is interesting to analyze. But it's, I mean, these, are, these are experiments which run, in fact, for, uh, for weeks, and then you count very few reversals, you try events, um, which in turn is overall nice. Well, um, we can also look into the case with rotation. So what we now uh, add is rotation, uh, and then we get other structures. So this large-scale convection world breaks down, and, and you get uh, these Ekman, so-called Ekman world disease, which leads to a shortcut in the production, a shortcut in the heat transfer. And uh, well, I only show this to you that also three-dimensional numerical variations are possible. Uh, but let's first focus on the global scaling laws for radicals. So, um, I have shown this before. Nussels were those radical number, and those days people thought there would be one scaling exponent. I mean, uh, really, from this knowledge of aromatization group theory and phase transition, <coughs> one universal exponent, this is called gamma here. And um, when you look at the gammas, which were popular those days, you find basically everything 
uh, in between 0.25 uh, and uh, one third, and depending on what liquid you would take, what pump number regime, what negative number regime, one, one, one or the other exponent uh, would show up. Uh, these authors all had very strong views that their exponents could be right and universal. Uh, and well, in particular, uh, this two sevenths was very popular here in Chicago. Uh, so there is a problem that deep for work. There, there was also a problem in the scaling of the Nussel number as function of the primal number. So the Schreiner and Fischer had suggested that Nussel would scale like 100 to the minus one sevenths. Um, and uh, we were boys for those of the postdoc here. Uh, then Shioni and the group of Sergio Schilberto, they suggested in the spirit uh, of the Chicago model, developed by the Chicago 9, that Brussel would go like 100 to the 2 sevenths. But clearly uh, not uh, consistent with each other. If you look at data here for different liquids, uh, you, are, you find that here is something, the slope of Brussel goes like 100 to the open one. Well, three, but when you go to even higher quantum number liquids, you see that there is a separation. But clearly, there was work, there was a need to do some work. So, here also for large quantum number, there was some separation, so you would like to understand this. And this, all this triggered us to do this unifying scaling theory uh, for a relevant R convection, which started with this paper and was developed over the years. So the backbone of the theory is seen here. These are these two exact relations for the energy dissipation rate, epsilon u, uh, defined here. It uh, affects the volume and time average uh, energy dissipation, and it scales with this relation. Exact. You can derive it from the Kuznetsky equation, um, and it's quite a remarkable relation because this is a volume average, whereas the Nusselt number, the heat flux, is the area average. And what's hidden behind this is basically Gaussian, Gaussian treatment. You do a Gaussian integration and, uh, uh, and uh, modify your volume integral to the surface integral, and then you get these heat fluxes. And I now let my students in the, the first uh, year of turbulence class derive this relation. You can derive it with some instructions and take this to one page, and you get this relation. And the same goes for the second relation, epsilon theta. Uh, what we call thermal dissipation, uh, which is related to the heat flux too. So these are exact relations. Uh, the first time I saw the written numbers of this paper here, but probably Guzinesk already knew them in the last in the 19th century. Um, so uh, they are pretty deep, and so the depth is inherited from the depth of the Gauss theory. And the central idea of the theory now is to split these dissipation rates into a bulk contribution and into a bubble layer contribution. And then uh, to, to really look at the dynamics and realize that the dynamics in the bulk and the dynamics in the bubble layer are different. And once you accept this, uh, then uh, pure scaling laws are gone. So here is the idea. You have a bulk at the bottom layer, and the total dissipation is uh, distributed in the bottom layer by the bulk part, same for the thermal part. Uh, is what you can argue is this fluid, a detached bottom layer, that would scale like the bottom layer. And uh, when you now uh, accept that the bulk physics is different from the bottom layer physics, then pure scaling laws are gone. Uh, so, the immediate consequence of this. So let me show you this conceptually. Here I show you Rayleigh versus Prandtl, uh, and I show you two lines. How I calculate these lines, I will show you later. But these lines are <coughs> the lines defined by the thermal dissipation being the same with the bone layer and the bulk, the same with the magnetic dissipation. And then you get four regimes. So in this regime here, uh, the both the thermal dissipation and the kinetic dissipation is dominated by the bone layer contribution. So this is for small angle number. Here, uh, everything is dominated by this respective bulk contribution, and here uh, the kinetic part is boundary layer dominated, and the thermal part is bulk dominated, and here it's vice versa. Uh, and uh, so, so that you get automatically, you don't get <coughs> where these lines are, but that there are these four domains that you already get from these general considerations. The question is now how to get the scaling or the, the, the uh, uh, contributions from these four. Distances. For domains. 
And well, we will estimate. So first, uh, for the bulk part, this is exactly the law uh, which uh, Nigel already showed in the first lecture. The energy dissipation in the bulk goes by u cubed over L. This doesn't say anything else, but that's a typical energy scale is u squared at the large scales. And the time scale is L over u. And putting this together, you get this expression here, and then you know dimensionalize it, you get the just goes by Reynolds cube. And the same for the thermal part. So the typical thermal energy goes by delta squared. And the time scale again, L over U, and then the thermal dissipation rate must go like this. Uh, if you write it non-dimensionally, you get this relation. For the bottom layer part, you argue differently. You say there's one length scale in the boundary layer, and this is the thickness of the boundary layer itself. And then the energy dissipation is nu times U over lambda U, the gradient, squared, and then the relative contribution from the boundary layer is lambda U over L. And the same for the thermal boundary layer. Uh, the typical thermal boundary layer thickness is lambda theta. The gradient is delta over lambda theta, and then you get this expression. Of course, you must know what are these boundary layers. How thick are these uh, laminar type boundary layers? And that you know, fortunately, from the quantum boundary layer theory. So the kinetic boundary layer scales like a 1 over uh, Reynolds uh, square root. And the thermal boundary layer has these two scaling laws. The Reynolds number with respect to Reynolds number is the same, but different Prandtl number dependence depending on whether the Prandtl number is large or whether it's small. And the reason that it scales differently is the following. Uh, once you have a small Prandtl number, uh, lambda u being much smaller than lambda theta, then you see uh, that the uh, k that the the kinetic boundary layer is nested in the thermal one, and the typical velocity scale seen uh, in the boundary layer, in the kinetic boundary layer, is u. When you go to very large Prandtl number, very viscous flow, uh, then you get very thick kinematic boundary layer, lambda u, and the thermal boundary layer is nested into this kinematic boundary layer, and then uh, what is seen in the thermal boundary layer is not u, but only a fraction of u, namely lambda and theta over lambda, uh, over, over lambda u times lambda u, and that enters uh, into this consideration. And uh, well, that you get your phase diagram, and uh, you get this additional line. Taking your phase diagram, you now split it into the upper part, and the lower part, and this line here, this line where lambda u, the kinematic boundary layer, equals the thermal boundary. And you model this transition in one or the other way. It doesn't matter too much how you model it, but clearly there must be such a transition. Um, well, there's uh, yet another complication. Well, 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 it's not it's, it's kind of, kind of trivial calculation. I said that the uh, boundary layer, the kinetic boundary layer, would go like length scale or square root of Reynolds. And that is the case, but if the Reynolds number goes to zero, the kinematic boundary layer can't go to infinity, there must be a cutoff. And the cutoff is the size of the system. The bottom layer can't be larger than the size of the system. And you model this in a similar way and put in an upper cutoff, and this is this line here. Uh, and then you get a regime up there, which is an infinite regime. And uh, well, we are nearly there. Uh, so we take our two balance equations and put in these four terms contribution uh, from the bulk. Uh, <coughs> and the uh, contribution of the bulk, contribution from the bottom layer, and the same for the thermal dissipation part. You don't know the prefactors. There are these uh, four prefactors C1, C2, C3, and C4, and that you don't know, uh, and that you adopt into the experimental data. I mean, basically, you only need four experimental data points. You see, it's two implicit equations. For Nussel and Reynolds, this function of Rayleigh and Prandtl, and once you have these uh, four, you have four values, and then you can calculate C1 to C4. But of course, you must then upgrade, you know, what are very reliable values for these four, and why you don't. So, what we did is we uh, took, in fact, um, 155 data points from the data who measured Nussel as a function of Rayleigh and Prandtl and put it in. There's additional parameter, in fact, the parameter of the random is critical. 
when you get so large that the boundary layer is basically everything is laminar, so you also don't know a priori, so that you also treat as a parameter. Uh, and once you do this, uh, in fact, you can fit the experimental data, so this 155 data points, uh, Nussel as function of Rayleigh and uh, Nussel as function of Trump, you can fit very, very nicely. And this determines uh, these uh, prefactors, and it also determines, in fact, all Nussel and Reynolds number as function of Rayleigh and Trump. Uh, okay, with predictive F and G. Did you go back to that F and G? Well, F and G, these are transition functions. I mean, these are somehow a trivial uh, uh, transition function from one regime to the other. We have these two regimes for upper and lower, and you must have to cross over. I mean, you could make it very sharp, but the smooth cross, cross over from one regime to the other. I mean, you see something like this. You see this guy for small x, it's one, and for large x, it, it is uh, back x, and, and then somehow. But, but you I mean, really, it's, it's, a, it's a detail how you model this, and it really doesn't matter. Where you did your fits, they were either zero or one. No, no, we, we use this full function here. I mean, we put in some number n here, n is four. Right, and or, or, or smooth. Uh, smooth, yeah, smooth. And smooth, interpolate. <coughs> smooth, <laughs> and I mean, the, the transition is uh, less, less than a uh, decade, I mean, to say, uh, one fifth of a decade is a transition. But we know it's two regimes. Uh, so this, that I don't treat as prior. Uh, it's a uh, of matter. And were a lot of your points between 0 and 1, or most of them were either 0 or well, 1? Well, either 0 or 1. I mean. Right. Uh, and uh, so you, you get this, and then you can describe uh, those data. And uh, let me show you the primary rule parameters space where the data are in, in this context of these of the routines. And you see here the data we have for those days. Um, and, uh, well, what well, you will see these blue data as data points by others. Basically, we would only need to know the need for, but it extrapolates over many orders of magnitude in Rayleigh and in Prandtl. And this uh, sends it a really very strong predictive power. Because, uh, well, we have lots of theory right here with these four numbers, and then we really can predict up here and down there. So, what is the result for Nussel as function of Rayleigh and Prandtl? Here is the result. So, Nussel. Compensated with value to the one half, that was melee. You see, no scale. It's really a smooth transition from one to the other. And if you happen to be around Pranto is one, with this curve, you can argue, well, this uh, looks like a straight line. And indeed, if you locally fit, it looks locally like two sevens. And this is what they had those days around here. But it's not, not a pure power. Uh, it's really a smooth transition from one to the other. Uh, and uh, well, these are the data by us. Uh, this is our theory, and these are the R's data. Compensated, Lussel compensated with value to the two sevens. If there would be scaling, it would be a straight line. If there would be scaling with two sevens, it would be a horizontal straight line, but clearly it is it's really a combination and smooth transition from one behavior to the other. And, um, I must say that uh, the, well, once you develop the theory, you always hope that people could immediately accept it, but it's only once they saw the experimental data, they, they accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite as for a citizen, it's kind of, uh, kind of disappointed, but, but uh, well, I mean, this is how it works. Uh, and the first time I spoke about this, uh, well, there are many people in the audience who would not know it's uh, two sevens, or no, it's uh, five nineteenths, or no, it's one third. But, well, they're all right, locally, because locally you can fit anything you want in between, <laughs> <laughs> in between, in between one fourth and, uh, and one third, you can have anything, but it's only local. I mean, that's the point. You have a smooth transition from dominance of the boundary layer <coughs> to what dominance of the boundary layer. Uh, but the same holds for Nussel as function of Prandtl here, no pure scaling. Of course, when you go to the extreme limits here for small Prandtl, you recover this Nussel goes like Prandtl to the 1 8, which I showed you before. This, uh, I showed you as Nussel goes like Prandtl to the 0 1 to the 1 3, it was the experimental data for small Prandtl. But then you have this bump and you have separation. Uh, and uh, indeed, Kushik Shah in Hong Kong uh, later measured 
those data points, so many people those days saw that there would be the saturation, that the slightly goes down, and we had this, this our, predict, our data was first, so we really predicted this, and I was very pleased that this would go down. And well, here is also as part for for different value number in the large regime, as you really see the bump, uh, and uh, like that. there's no way to describe it with one kilo scale. Uh, and the same holds for Reynolds. Reynolds is a function of Rayleigh. So here I composite Reynolds with Rayleigh to the one half. And again, no pure scaling, but smooth transitions from one regime to the other. And if you now compare it to experimental data, well, what do you do? You take the data which are there, and here we have data by Peng Atom uh, for Rayleigh between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10, those data points. Then we fit those data points, assuming that there would be some power law, we get this fit here, Reynolds would go like Reddit to 0.455, and then we take our theory and do the fit exactly the same regime, and then we get Reynolds goes like 0.447, and I was very pleased to see this very, very quickly. Um, so, one crucial assumption of the theory is that the boundary layers are of the pipe. Quantum blazes, so laminar type boundary layers. And we all know at some point this must break down and get more and more turbulent. So you see the young quantum and this old PhD blazes. And well, you want to check when this is happening. And well, let's look at the Reynolds number. So uh, I calculate the shear Reynolds number, which goes with the thickness of the boundary layer, and uh, this is basically that the shear Reynolds number goes like a square root of the Reynolds number. And then I look at what is for water. Uh, for water, the Reynolds, the shear Reynolds number affects only 15 or 100. It's not so large. So already, people always say relevant are turbulence, but for most lab experiments, it's not so turbulent. This is also what Leo told me from looking at the, at the experiments by the observator. It isn't so prevalent. Uh, and indeed, when you compare those values with the values uh, where you, you have the transition, uh, it's, it's not so large. So clearly, uh, uh, below 10 to the 14, for example, at around 4, you don't have to the turbulence. And uh, the transition to turbulence, well, it's uh, not. Uh, linear instability. The fact that this is non-normal, non-normal, non-linear, non-normal instability towards turbulence. And when you look at typical values where it happens, uh, and you look at lambda Lifshitz, if you know well, shear Reynolds number around 400. So lambda Lifshitz writes 420, so this is what we took. And we, we made it our phase diagram and look when is the Reynolds number uh, 420 is along this line. So the theory uh, must be uh, extended towards a turbulent boundary layer regime beyond this line. Yeah. So here, in fact, you have laminar type boundary layer and turbulent valve, but here the boundary layer becomes turbulent. And um, uh, within uh, the theory we predict, so the theory, so to say, predicts its own uh, end when it breaks down and when it needs extensions. And this turns out to be Franco has uh, one. Uh, you have uh, around 10 to 14. You have to break down the theory and you must treat the boundary layer differently. Let's now look at the data points these days. Uh, well, 200, uh, 2012. Uh, all these data points were added. Uh, and you see that indeed there are data points in this regime, and in particular those data points were going to ask, these pink data points. And they go well into this other region. Uh, but let's first look at this numerical data point here. I would like to discuss this data point. And this is this simulation which I showed you before. It's a three dimensional simulation. The Rayleigh is 2 times 10 to the 12, started by Richard Stevens, a PhD student uh, from our group. And it's really a major simulation if you uh, imagine that what they could reliably measure in Chicago. In the early 90s, this was up to 10 to the 11. So, this is already beyond it. It's 3D and it is well resolved. Um, and, well, uh, how is it done? It's huge simulation on this grid. It's uh, on it's 10 to the 7 CPU hours. It's 1000 CPU years. Uh, and, uh, well, this is a fast computer in the Netherlands, so it goes up to 750 of this. Uh, 
the limiting thing is the uh, is was the upscaling and the parallelization of the world. It must have the world be parallelized. And uh, the trick to achieve this large Reynolds number was not to parallelize the thing layer by layer, uh, but to really uh, have a so called pencil code where we parallelize things here. So in one core, you don't take the whole layer because it's already too large, but you put this in pencils and these pencils uh, communicate. So these grants uh, for these kind of calculations, they come now in units of uh, 100 million CPU hours. And uh, it's really major, it's really major, major effort. And it's only possible thanks to so-called price grants, which we have in Europe. I mean, in Europe, I think we can be pretty lucky to have this. Um, in the US, uh, the effort is kind of more localized, even from uh, the state to state, whereas in Europe put together all these capacities and we can calculate the machines in Italy, Germany, France, Switzerland, uh, and uh, can do calculations of this time. Um, so, um, we developed this code, uh, and it's based on, this is by the way, an effort led by Roberto Basico, as we collaborate with a uh, uh, difference code, a scheme which he developed, which can be extremely well parallelized, uh, and uh, to get help in parallelization, you also need experts uh, from computer scientists to really make this uh, parallel and extremely efficient. And we did this with our PhD students, and uh, it's open source, so you can uh, go to the web page and you can download this and, and use it. Uh, so, um, it's a direct medical simulation, uh, no turbulence modeling whatsoever, second order final difference, uh, and the most time goes into the pressure correction method, this is the some sort. Uh, I mean, this is where, where the time in these numerical simulations is keeping up. And we kind of use this code, we not only calculate thermal convection, but we also double the fusion convection, and all the Taylor red, and I come to this uh, later. Um, one extra requirement, uh, which was necessary here, in particular for large part numbers, is uh, that the uh, temperature field must live on a finer grid uh, as compared to the velocity. So when you look in detail here between the temperature field and the velocity field, you will realize that the temperature field is somehow rougher. Uh, there are uh, more pronounced structures there. And this is very well known from turbulence. Uh, that extreme events are larger for the temperature as compared uh, to the velocity. So it's expressed in so-called uh, the temperature field is more intermittent as compared to the velocity field. And then you must take care of this. And what we did is that we manipulated the velocity field uh, in between the grid points and uh, had not only one temperature point in the middle, but several, uh, and had a finer grid. And it was only with this trick we could go to the large part of numbers. Yes. And usually the velocity, velocity fluctuations are Gaussian, but the velocity radius must have got the power of the exponential temperature. Yes. 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 So the gradients, uh, in fact, are non Gaussian. They have these wings. And uh, the smaller the difference, the larger the wings are. This is called intermittency. But this tendency for the temperature field is even more pronounced because you have this temperature fronts passing through the system, which makes it extremely intermittent. And well, the max you have to take care of it. You really have to do something while you don't want to handle this off. And well, this is the trick, and with this, we really can treat uh, Schmidt numbers up to 1000. Uh, so the ratio uh, between the two diffusivities, uh, well, the concentration field and temperature field. Uh, so, uh, well, you use a normal grid, a defined grid, and uh, all these problems, which are at the normal grid, you get rid of with this trick. Uh, and well, here you see the numerical simulations, and I show this because the NATO also enjoys these numerical simulations quite a bit. I mean, this one, in fact, he, I, I could still show him in May last year, when I was visiting, and he enjoys the numerical calculation quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And there, is, uh, there was also many numerical efforts here with Dr. Kong and Bob Rosner, and Bruno Leo uh, co initiated quite a bit of this. Um, so, uh, well, this was not the effort to get this data point, the highest uh, data point in the numerics, but 
it's still far from this regime, from this ultimate regime where you have this transition toward a total block of that. And now I went in so much detail how to go further, and, and we just decided by the way to take uh, yet another effort to go further. And for small aspect ratio, gamma is 1.23. We now think that we can go here as a discuss off. And we, will, we decided to address our high from the million CPU hours in the time, which we got to really get to this onset of this ultimate regime, to see the onset uh, of the instability in the uh, But let's also go to the experimental effort uh, to go to this ultimate regime. And these are the experiments by Günther Aas and Ewan Wurtschatz in Göttingen. And those are huge. So they uh, built on the street in Chicago to use pressurized uh, gases. So in Chicago, they had helium close to the critical point. With this, you have very low um, viscosity and thermal conductivity, and you can go up very high in red number. And Günther carried on with this trick, and he went to SF6, pressurized SF6, at uh, 20 bar. And with that, he also get uh, very low viscosity and thermal conductivity. Um, and the big advantage uh, with SF6, in fact, is that you go on the slide, so Pankow is constant. With uh, helium, you always go up here, and uh, in your experiment, the Pankow number is not constant, right? You, you move up and you move up here, and to go along this line that is achieved with SF6. And the pressurize is here, it is a huge experiment here, uh, and well, you see the scale here, and uh, with that, if I achieve those the data points here. So I, here I show you data points. I mean, I won't address the red data points, which are the so-called Grenoble data. Nobody knows why they are going up here. Uh, I won't address this. I mean, the turbulence is this it used to be a big controversy. We now people look at it. I mean, some of these data are different. Nobody knows what's going on. I will focus on those data points for ours here, the new ones, uh, and our, our theory is here. Uh, those data, the black data points are numerical data points, this is our theory, and uh, these are the data points by the Mela and R from 2000, which show a larger scatter, but in principle the same trend, but they so, show much scatter that they don't see the onset. But what good others did, which is extremely precise experiments, is that he really was so precise to see this transition. And if you really go into this extremely noisy data by Mela and R, you see, plus they may have uh, found it already 10 years earlier, if they had measured precisely enough. But well, they didn't. So let's focus here on the experiments by Alas and Bocha, and you see it goes on. So there is a transition uh, towards something else to enhance heat transfer, and this transition is at 10 to the 14. Uh, and uh, this transition is also seen in other indicators, for example, with the Reynolds number, with different statistics. Uh, and, uh, well, yeah, probably differently, this will compensate it well with Rayleigh. Uh, and you see it's getting steeper, and indeed, it's the ultimate state of the very natural. This is when the laminar type boundary layer becomes turbulent because of turning up shear. This transition seems to be independent of the aspect ratio, and when you extrapolate here to the ultimate regime, you get a scaling of 0.38. Uh, and I'll come to this scaling more uh, later, where it is. And I was very pleased to see this, uh, also at this value, because uh, in 2001, we had predicted that this transition should happen at 10 to the 14. And then 10 years later, in uh, 2012, our measure the heat, there is this transition here. Uh, and um, it shows all characteristics of this breaking down of the laminar type boundary layer toward the turbulent boundary layer. So, here I show you the largest numerical simulation just before the breakdown. Uh, so, uh, Roberto Basico, my friend and colleague, he was uh, uh, already optimistic. He said he could see signatures of. Uh, of the to transition to the, to, uh, to, to the turbulent regime. This is just uh, above the boundary layer. I mean, I think it's not there yet. Uh, and uh, the full blown the transition is only at 10 to the 14. Uh, but well, it shows the structures and also it shows what you can do with simulations of this time. 
What would it look like if it were there? Uh, well, I mean, what were you looking for? Well, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I share your concern. So, um, uh, well, how would you see it in movies like this? I mean, right. uh, you would. Uh, well, you will see some more rougher dynamics. I will show you the tailor pad in the second part of the lecture where you see some transitions and where you see differences. Uh, but uh, I, I share the concern that here you can't see any features of the solution. I mean, what you must do, you must measure uh, profiles uh, and you must measure uh, the heat flux. And this is how you can see it. And there you see changes. So, what's the scaling in this algebraic regime? Well, the terminal and bottom layer apply their log corrections. Uh, and in fact, uh, Kreichner, back in 1962, has already predicted uh, how the turbulent uh, how this algebraic regime would look like. And what he argued is that Nussel goes like value to the one half. This is dimensional analysis. When you assume that Nussel is independent of uh, viscosity and thermal conductivity, and you do dimensional analysis, you get value to the one half. But you get log corrections. And log corrections because uh, of the logarithmic boundary layers. And in Kreinland's paper, he derived log corrections of this type. When you go in this regime around 10 to the 14, uh, and plot this and do a log log fit, effectively, then around this regime, it looks like 0.238. Uh, if you go larger, of course, this vanishes more and more. And then if you go to Rayleigh and 10 to the 40 or so, you are very close to one half. But it's very hard to approach. Um, well, this crying down table is extremely hard to read. And when I was a PhD student, I was ashamed that I didn't quite understand it. But uh, later, both Leo Karanov and um, Siegfried Rossmann, my PhD advisor, both, uh, both uh, at some point also asked me, did you ever understand this paper? And uh, they didn't know. And they both said they also didn't understand it. So, <laughs> <laughs> it was very relieved by that. Uh, Did you ever so, ask a question? Huh? Did you ever ask a question? Did you ever ask a question? Did you 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 uh, and this I understand, and well, this gives the same result with respect to, uh, to the Nussel bar, but this 0.38, both uh, mean relative to one half times log corrections. And when you look at, into this, indeed, you have this transition regime, and use the algebraic regime, and tell you have to scale it. Uh, but what is the corresponding scaling with respect to the Reynolds number? So, uh, the Kreinert theory for Nussel uh, and our theory, they say the same. Uh, for Reynolds number, Kreinert also uh, predicted some log corrections here. Whereas in our theory, miraculously, these log corrections somehow cancel out, and for Reynolds, you get a pure value to the one half. And well, what of these is correct, if any? When we look at the Gutter data, uh, the other data, and here is compensated in this algebraic regime, no corrections. So this seems to be one half. It's not very pronounced, and I come to tell again later where it's more pronounced. Uh, but at least this is consistent with the cancellation of the work. Um, and uh, so the next signature is, this is uh, the Pierre's question on what are the signatures of the bottom layer. And the signatures of the bottom layer uh, is the, the profile, the log profile. This is the signature of the turbulent bottom layer. And uh, in fact, ours uh, measure to the temperature Profile and uh, well, this is in fact uh, linear, 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 and here you have uh, linear log, and you see this log law. It's a signature of a thermal and boundary layer, um, and uh, well, clearly you seem to be in the algebraic mm -hmm. regime. Um, so it's logarithmic, and it uh, suggests that indeed uh, some transition has happened. Uh, and well, you now must match the logarithmic temperature bound layer here, and the logarithmic temperature bound layer here, and then you match with the center, and so somehow the picture which evolves in the algebraic regime is following. You have a viscous sub-layer, which is very thin, you have a log layer, you have some core, and you have also a thick log layer, and, and here. So this is what, uh, what you get. Whereas in the uh, classical regime, you have primal basis layer, and right here you also have something which looks like a log layer later, 
but basically it can be seen as a plural, but I, I won't go into this analogy. So the answers to Leo's question uh, here are, are clear. What is the flow of organizations? Well, we have groups, roles, and reversals, and we really understand the, the organization pretty well. Um, on the scaling mode, I discussed a lot. There's no pure scaling, in particular, no two separate scaling, but you have smooth transitions from one scaling to the other. Uh, and on the ultimate regime, uh, well, there is an ultimate regime. It is not what they had in mind those days, I and mean, this really was the artifact of the measurements. What, what happened, I and mean, what was interesting, is they put in a probe, a thermal probe, and the boundary layer became so thin, um, this boundary layer around this probe uh, became, became so thick because the probe was so thin that there was thermal diffusion to the boundary layer, and uh, basically they had a, a low pass surface. So the fluctuations were so quickly in the turbulent bulk that the probe was too slow, or the boundary layer around this probe was too slow to respond to this. And this led to this transition. But indeed, uh, at much higher wave rate numbers, there is an ultimate regime. So Leo envisioned this ultimate regime, so asked for our questions, and indeed uh, it's there and was found experimentally by others in uh, 2004. And well, for relevant now, I give you these two radio articles which we wrote, one on the global flow organization and one in fact on the small scale properties, so scaling these issues which I didn't address in this uh, talk. In this, uh, 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 talk. Uh, I also wanted to save some time for Taylor Gratt, uh, the other Drosophila of uh, physics of fluids and, uh, and turbulence. And in fact, these two systems have been called twins of turbulent research by Fritz Busse on the occasion of the publication of the ultimate regime, both the experimental ultimate regime in Rennes-Venar and the ultimate regime in Taylor Gett, and I will now come uh, to this uh, paper. Uh, so, uh, here we have the Taylor Gett system, and uh, what is transported is the angular velocity. And when we compare Relevenar and Delacret, we see many, many similarities. So in Relevenar, uh, you get this temperature profile, and you get this wind, which smooths out this temperature profile, and you get the thermal bond layer and kinetic bond layer. In uh, Delacret, you have kind of the same. What's transported here is, is the angular velocity. You also get a profile now of omega. Uh, and uh, we get vorticity bound layers and we get kinetic bound layers. And when you work this out quantitatively here, and very now and Taylor Gat, you see you have to conserve heat flux, and Taylor Gat you have to conserve angular velocity flux, exact relation. And for this, you define what we call a Lussel number, so the flux over the lamina flux. The driving here was a variant number, and here the driving is the Taylor number. You have this exact relation here, here you also get an exact relation. What you have to do here to get this exact relation, you have to substrate, subtract the kinetic, kinematic dissipation for the lamina case. Here, for the lamina case, so to say, was the case where nothing was moving and then there is no extra dissipation, so here you have to subtract zero. But uh, in the lamina case, there is some flow and then you have to subtract. But once you do this, you also get this exact relation here between the dissipation and Nussel and Taylor. What's the primal here is a geometric parameter here. We call it geometric primal number. And it is given by eta. And eta is a ratio between the inner and the outer cylinder. So it's a geometric quantity, which you can also say. And here you have the scaling Nussel goes by gradient to the beta. And now you have the scaling Nussel omega goes by Taylor to the beta. But otherwise, there is mathematical analogy between these two systems. Um, and, well, there were no experiments for Taylor Pratt, or not many experiments for Taylor Pratt, uh, and we really wanted to see what's going on. And we built this, what we call, a terminal Taylor Pratt machine. So the primary space is the inner cylinder, outer cylinder, and the radius measure eta. It's a huge parameter space. And uh, people had looked into this before, but only in the lamina regime. So look at the numbers. Mammals number 1,000, and here up to 2,000, here up to 4,000. And I sweetly looked into this, finding an extremely uh, complicated regime, wavy outflow, twist, tailor vortex, wavy vortex flow, modulated waves, so extremely complicated. Uh, 
and we wanted to go much beyond. We wanted to go to the turbo version. <laughs> six, and then this version is here. And uh, so what's going on? And there was not so much. <laughs> Uh, here you see the experimental explore regime in 2010. <coughs> there was some experiment without other rotations. Uh, those. Here you have core rotation and you have counter rotation. The only experiment with core and counter rotation was done by Vent, 1933. Vent is yet another PhD student from Pando, like Nusselt, uh, like Blasius, like Bono, they are all PhD students from Pando. Uh, and when measured those data points here, and we saw with all this new terminology, we could do better than when, and fill this parameter space, uh, which we'll show in, this, in the second half of our slide. So here's our machine, 20 turbulent Taylor graph. You will see it's rotating. And it's a pretty violent machine. Um, so it was altogether 111 liters of water. And the turbulence is so strong that the heating of the liquid is 1 Kelvin per minute. So we must also cool, and we need a 20 kilowatt cooling. So we must pay electricity bill twice, <laughs> once to <laughs> uh, and then a uh, second uh, to cool it down. It's really a major, uh, major setup. Uh, in a cylinder uh, up to 10 Hz, other cylinder up to 20 Hz, and we achieve here uh, a few 10 to the 6. Um, and and what we measure is torque, we measure it only in a little to avoid edge effects. And this is how the particular space looks like now. Uh, so it's really filled. It's not only filled with uh, experimental data up here, but also filled with many numerical data, and I will also show this a little bit, uh, how, uh, how this was, was filled with light. Uh, so many people jump onto this, and uh, we now have a very really, uh, reasonable understanding on telegraph turbulence. Uh, so here uh, is the phase space of inner and outer uh, Reynolds numbers. So here only inner cylinder rotation, and here core rotation, here counter rotation. Uh, and uh, what are the control parameters? Well, rather than uh, Reynolds inner and Reynolds outer, we go to Taylor and A. A is the ratio between the angular velocities, and these will be the control parameters for the time being. And when we look at our measurements, Lussel versus Taylor and versus A. You see Nussel is 1,000. This is much larger than we good for the Nussel in the Red Velar case. So in some sense, you already see here that there is more turbulence. Uh, and this is also confirmed uh, by, by this movie, by this plot. So what I show you, uh, in this PIV, I show you uh, the convective angular velocity flux. This is color, this is Nussel omega locally. You see a huge fluctuations. Uh, so uh, when we go and average, we get this statistic. <coughs> from this, you need to judge whether the flux goes from inner to outer or from outer to inner. So large are the fluctuations. I mean, the flux turns out to be uh, 325. But look at the fluctuation: 100,000 and minus 100. So this is what Nigel mentioned before on these huge fluctuations uh, that will exist in. But let's uh, focus on the scaling laws first, uh, and in particular on the scaling uh, as function of Taylor, because it's analog to the, to the scaling as function of Taylor. Uh, and uh, in particular, let's focus on an ultimate regime, uh, which in Taylor graph is much easier to achieve. Ultimate Taylor graph turbulence. And what you see is you can get, indeed, get scaled for various A, uh, or very close to the stop point uh, 3A. I mean, we, we go a little bit higher uh, in. Uh, we're, we're a little bit more beyond the onset uh, of the ultimate regime, so the exponent is a little bit higher, approaching this one half. Here we measure Taylor as of 4.39. Uh, and, uh, well, we compensate, we see very nice uh, scaling for this ultimate regime, and the exponent for all A is around 0.38. So it's really this ultimate regime. What about now the sheer Reynolds number scale? I showed you this tiny regime of the shear Reynolds number scaling for the relevant R. But here for the Taylor Pratt case, it's much more pronounced. So, how to calculate this? So, we calculate all this boundary layer thickness, uh, and uh, you, uh, you realize that the correction from this wind are very small. And when you do all this, you get these data shear Reynolds number versus Taylor number. 
uh, and you see you are beyond this 400. Uh, I, I showed you the onset would be around say 200 or 400, and now with our experimental data, we are all beyond. So we are the ultimate regime. It drives so strongly. In Sweeney, uh, at onset, clearly it wasn't the ultimate regime, but with a strong mechanical driving, we are the ultimate regime. We are up here, and the uh, exponent, in fact, is more happy. What is the what is the, it's the boundary layer, a boundary layer that's going Becoming total, yes. So, so um, I, 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 well, I mean, here, this regime is, this is when the laminar type boundary layer becomes total, because it's so strongly sheared. Uh, or both cylinders, in this case, yes. Both cylinders and both cylinders that become turbulent, and then these features of this laminar boundary layer, so these characteristics of quantum blasius, all the layer sequence goes like L over square root of Randall, this breaks down and you get these log corrections. And this already here happens at uh, around 2 times 10 to the 8, then you see this transition. Uh, and beyond, uh, you get, uh, in fact, uh, the ultimate state, and in the ultimate, well, here you can see this uh, transition. Nussut compensated with Taylor to the one third versus Taylor, uh, and uh, well, the onset of the ultimate regime is, is right here. So this is all DNS data, um, and uh, well, this is experimental data in the ultimate regime, and you see the Nussut number goes up uh, because there's better transport through a turbulent <coughs> um, So you have a sharp transition towards uh, dynamics, so rather than a static solution now here for a very low area number, you get some dynamics, you get this, all this regime by Harry Sweeney, uh, but uh, this ultimate regime you get here, this transition to the ultimate regime of around 2 times 10 to the 8. What we had in Rally Benar at uh, 10 to the 14, here we already get much earlier, which the engineers told me, well, it's clear, we all know mechanical driving is so more efficient as compared to thermal driving, and yes, we get it much earlier. Also, when you look at these balances and also the absolute numbers of Nussel number, this mechanical driving is simply more efficient than we are immediately in the ultimate regime. Uh, so, we have a transition from the ultimate regime from the laminar Kramer Blasius type bound layer to so the turbulent Kramer von Kramer type bound layer. So, here, von Kramer and Kramer, uh, this is associated with the wrong layer. So, what's the corresponding scaling in this ultimate regime for the Reynolds number? Uh, and well, I remind you of the scaling controversy here between uh, our theory and Kreinland, and Kreinland suggested log corrections. So let's now look at Reynolds versus Rayleigh, uh, with a very pronounced ultimate regime, and indeed we see uh, very nice scaling. Taylor, this Reynolds goes by Taylor to the 0.495 plus minus 0.01, so clearly consistent uh, with this, uh, this one half without any log corrections. Um, so, let's uh, show also this log profile uh, in, uh, in the velocity. So, this is a numerical simulation, and these are experiments, and here you see the log profile uh, very nicely pronounced. Sorry. So, uh, <coughs> this is uh, the famous Van Kamen floor with the Van Kamen constant. I, I won't go into this, this is a turbulent uh, signature of the turbulent boundary layer. For the Kalman constant, but what we see is that it is approached here with this curve, and it also works for the outer cylinder. So, really, we have a turbulent boundary layer with a log profile. <coughs> so, here we have the region, we have a core, we have a log layer here, we have a log layer here, and with the sub layer here. Uh, uh, well, how do the corresponding flow patterns look like? Uh, for that, we need numerical simulations. Uh, and um, to do this, we use our code again, but we do it in an intelligent way. So here is another Stokes equation. We go from the lab frame, we go to the rotating frame. And in the rotating frame, you, uh, there, you are co-rotating with the other cylinder, and after this transformation, you get, in fact, an extra force, body force, Coriolis force, and this is this force. And when you then rewrite your another Stokes equation, you naturally see that the control parameter the shear Reynolds number and the inverse Mosby number. It's this guy automatically shows up 
in front of the Toyota Force. Uh, why Rosby number is Rosby to the minus one? Uh, well, they should have defined it the other way around. So the control parameter is Rosby to the minus one, uh, and uh, well, the, the, the larger Rosby to the minus one, the stronger you rotate. I, I think it would have been much more natural to call Rosby to the minus one Rosby, but that is how it is. Uh, and the second uh, uh, control parameter, I leave the Taylor number. So Taylor number basically is shear Reynolds number squared. And uh, so rather than these control parameters, I now have these control parameters here, rows to the minus 1, where it was Taylor. Uh, and this is what we explore numerically, thanks to this trace project. In, uh, on this line, there's no uh, authors with no rotation, because on this line, we explore the full parameter space. Um, and first, we go to the situation where the outer cylinder is fixed, and we increase uh, the inner cylinder rotation in the direction, and we see these instabilities. So we go along this line, and what we see here is the uh, boundary layer of laminar type. So right here, not much going on, there is fluid detachment. Uh, but when we go higher and Taylor number, we get the turbulent features. See, there's much, much more life in there. But to judge in what regime it is, you really must look into these profiles uh, and into the statistics. Uh, but well, I mean, at least here you get the idea that uh, there's a different regime as compared to the other regime. This is already the other regime. Um, so, uh, what we want to uh, do is we want to characterize the structures in the other regime. Uh, and uh, in particular, these Taylor roads. So, uh, the general uh, intuition is that all these structures would break down. So, the more turbulent you become, so more these structures break down. And when you look at changes in the axial velocity over the axis, indeed, you see that these uh, changes get less with increasing Taylor number. For this case of only inner layer. Uh, in uh, so the large scale structures become less beyond this transition. Um, well, what you have is you have uh, the boundary layers, they are uh, of the log profile as I showed you before. Uh, but uh, how do these transitions change with the outer cylinder now rotating? What you would expect, so we now not only go along this line, but we go all over. So what we would expect is uh, when we have uh, co rotation, uh, we would have a flow stabilization uh, because uh, once you are in a situation where the inner cylinder is at rest and the outer is rotating, it's a stable situation, uh, and outer cylinder rotation, core rotation should stabilize. Uh, what you also expect is that if you have weak counter rotation, um, then you would have enhanced turbulence because the shear is stronger. And what you also expect is when you have very strong counter rotation, uh, then if you are in a similar situation as there, then you stabilize because everything is stabilized from the outer cylinder rotation. So let's see what's going on. Uh, well, first of the global flow properties, Nussel, Omega versus Taylor. Uh, for all cases, you get this 0.38 here, so not much of a change. But now we look at the amplitude. Uh, with respect to the scaling. So we scale out this Taylor to 0 0.39 and look at the amplitude, and indeed we get optimal turbulence, so the best transportation for slight counter rotation. At uh, uh, 1 over rho p is minus 0.22, here the optimal transport properties. So according to this expectation, the best turbulence, best transport property when we slightly go the counter rotate. Uh, and uh, well, how is the flow organization? So you want to uh, correlate this local flow organization with these global transport properties. And what's striking is that here, uh, with the case where you have slight counter rotation at the optimum, the omega, uh, the angular velocity, has a flat profile. And what does it mean? A flat profile means that plumes and structures uh, which detach from the boundary layer uh, they uh, enter the bulk with some lower energy when, they, when there's a gradient here. In contrast, when you have a flat bulk, plumes enter uh, the bulk with more energy. 
and they drive the flow in a stronger way. Uh, so the local fluorization, the omega profile, as you see uh, various cases in one of our low speed. So three main cases. Uh, Co-rotation, row speed is 0.2. Uh, the center, there is good Q mixing and therefore you still have some gradient. Then the optimal case is the blue case where you are straight. And when you start to stabilize the flow from other cylinder rotation, uh, then in fact you, uh, you, you get a very strange profile, this profile here, uh, which is uh, a little bit complicated. This agrees very well with the experiments. Uh, here, by the way, you're very strong dependent on Z, and we can only measure at certain sets. So, but otherwise, this is confirmed between the numerics and the experiments. And well, how does it look like? Here you see the local flow organization. Um, for the co rotation, it looks very boring. Uh, but for the uh, maximum counter rotation, you see this very pronounced structure in vertical direction. So you see these tail rolls. So these rolls mean that there's more convective transport. And we find also with other cases that we change other parameters uh, that. Uh, there's always enhanced transport once you have these roads. And this is very surprising because you would assume when you increase uh, the tail number more and more, this structure would vanish. And indeed, once you have only inner, uh, inner uh, cylinder rotation, this is the case, but once you also have outer vanish number, vanish outer cylinder rotation, then uh, this. Uh, Roads, tail rolls survive even in the turbulent state and lead to this enhanced transport. Uh, and well, when you then start to uh, counter rotate from the other cylinder, you see the rolls survive and you get stabilization from the other cylinder. Um, so here you see the very surprising results that at the optimum uh, slight counter rotation, uh, this uh, characteristics of the inhomogeneity in axial direction goes up with tail so this is what we all expected. Only inner uh, Reynolds number, inner cylinder rotation, it goes down. Structures vanish with increasing area number, but not at optimum tailored bed. Then they go up. They go up. And in fact, it is this um, survival of the tailor rolls which leads to this peak in uh, the uh, transfer properties. Uh, so here you see the uh, flow features of the strongly counter-rotating regime uh, stabilized from here and here is the uh, turbulent bottom layer. Um, and you see now when you look at the statistics, this is a neutral surface where omega is zero with increasing uh, <coughs> uh, outer rotation, it's pushed outwards. So no neutral line uh, for a very slight uh, counter rotation, but when you increase your counter rotation, you stabilize your flow from the outside. Uh, so, well, all together, you get this phase diagram here one over low speed versus Taylor. Uh, so, when with no outer rotation, laminar Taylor rolls, turbulent Taylor rolls, and the feature is algebraic regime. Uh, here is the transition to the algebraic regime. This line here is optimum Taylor grad, optimum in the sense. Uh, largest transport from the inner to the outer, um, and you see that these tailor rolls survive here. This is what I showed you. And uh, well, it's extremely rich, featureless, uh, atomic regime, laminar bottom layer, featureless bulk, and so on. And here you have this counter rotating regime. And well, we reveal this whole thing. If you now put it in this different phase diagram, like Reynolds inner versus Reynolds outer, it's, it's modeled like this. And this little point here is an under rack. Regime, which I showed you before, Sweeney Anderek. And even on a log scale here, this is Anderek and Sweeney. So we are really now much, much further in this huge parameter regime of Taylor Gap. And you know how interesting this already was, and well, this uh, is adding, but we understand these transitions and why it was further on. And well, I, this I will skip. Uh, now I show you how things depend on either, so I know that Nitro is particularly interested in this ether dependence, but I was also particularly interested in the last part of your talk, which you skipped to, and I will do the same to you. <laughs> so I will skip this. Uh, and well, this well, is the same. Well, that you have time to give also. <laughs> and uh, well, this is uh, the broad review, this is just came out, the annual review of Human Beings on Taylor Bad. And um, I, what I will show you is my last thing is the startup behavior. Uh, in fact, we now rotate the uh, inner.
that cylinder and experiment in numerics and you see how all these proofs uh, vanish. So this movie I also could still show Leo and I asked him whether it would be a valid banana or tell uh, because the valid banana would look like the same. If you start to heat your lower plate, it starts. So uh, this is tell again. The gravity in fact goes in this direction. Here is the axis. Uh, and we start to play and see how all these proofs develop. And well, I showed you mathematically, uh, it's the same. I mean, it's the same equations. And in fact, you could view Taylor Gap Travel as non Gutenberg Travel than R because of the slight asymmetry between the inner and the outer cylinder. And with this, I would like to end and we'll leave room for questions. Well, I mean, also with the uh, uh, final number, you, you also get, in uh, some cases, you get width, yeah. and uh, then you have very pronounced uh, heat transfer. Yeah. And when you uh, then you have more the finger machine, this is for last final number, uh, where the heat transfer is done with less. But the width helps. The Taylor Gap it helps a lot, and uh, also the value of the helps a lot to have large reactor, large uh, muscle number. But the absolute numbers of muscle again, the Taylor Gap, they are much higher. Because of the No? Yes. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> what about a geometry, the Afghan independence? Uh, for Taylor Gap or whatever you want? Well, uh, I guess both. In, in, in Taylor Gap, it's the radius ratio. Yes. And, and, and in fact, it's also the aspect okay. ratio. So the aspect, the your aspect ratio, though, is always large. As opposed to the, the, the uh, Well, I mean, uh, here we look uh, in fact the cases with large aspect ratio, where the plate effects would play a role, but you also have interesting dynamics where the plate does play a role, and when you have Taylor Gap in small systems, with the plate effects. very strongly perturbed And then it's still the job, but Marley didn't focus on that. Uh, yeah, uh, but. You can't do the art for a large gamma or one side gamma is a third for large aspects of the many rules. Well I mean you uh, I mean the, 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 you, you can do um, in fact uh, uh, than I with large gamma. Then no, we have uh, turbulent. Turbulent. Strong turbulent. Well I mean uh, we can. In fact what we did is we had a gamma up to 64, 64 to 1. And we went up in red in number up to 10 to the 8. We can't go higher, but then it's just 10 to the 8. Because then we, we then spent, in the max, we spent uh, the computational time to go sideways. Uh, and so, so even for gamma is uh, uh, 64, now 10 to the 8 is possible um, to, to see a, a separation. Like this is in line of research we are doing now. The question is um, when do you get separation? So what typical structures would show up? Um, for gamma as one, the structures are of course restricted to one. Sideboards. But if you keep the height of one, it makes it larger and larger and larger. How large do the structures get sideboards? <coughs> when you look at the spectrum, when do you get saturation? And what we found to our big surprise is that we would get saturation only around 10. So we would still have an involvement of the spectra when we go larger and larger, only from the 10 on its separation, then we went up to 64 to make sure uh, that nothing else would happen. But we get structures in lateral direction, which are in length uh, of, in terms of this height, uh, 10, I mean very, very large, which, which was a big surprise for me. I really haven't expected that. But you can go in this direction, but it's of course extremely expensive. There's no way that we can go so high in relative. Mm -hmm. 
So we can either spend the, uh, the time, that, but the way the same what holds in the numeric sort of experiment, because they, they need tanks. So you either go with a limited random number of sidewalks, and what we can do is uh, then to the 8 and 64, or we go uh, upwards in random number up to 10 to the 14, but then it's gamma 0.23. You can't have both. Wow. Neither, ne neither an experiment. Henry. So this is maybe a little bit more a soci sociological or, or possibly financial question. So, uh, so where's this, this field now? Uh, this is incredibly complex stuff. There is an incredible experimental effort that, that you showed at various labs. I mean, look at the, these experiments, they are, they are massive. They, they sometimes require maybe a whole building. Uh, and then the computation uh, requires I don't know, well, it's thousands of hours. Um, so are we hitting another wall here or a limit? Uh, what, what is next or what could be next? Well, I mean, uh, what, what I think would be relevant uh, the next issue is to really explore this ultimate regime. Uh, right now, we have ultimate regime in Taylor Pet, and rather than R, we are lost at the borderline, and uh, in fact, what we see in experiments is less than one decade ultimate regime. Uh, Evan Bodenschatz in Göttingen has plans to really go up to 10 to the 16 to really have uh, two, two and a half decades in the upper regime, in the ultimate regime, to really explore what's going on there. But he has to build what? A uh, whole new building for that, right? Well, he will have a new building and he will have uh, to have even more SF6, so he's already buying now uh, the world production of SF6. <laughs> uh, that. In fact, uh, what he has, the, number, the amount of SF6 corresponds to about one half of the world's production per year. This is what he has. It's really a major effort, but for this ultimate regime uh, to really understand what's going on, what's the transition, uh, I think it's a really worthwhile effort. And also for the numerics, I mean, we, we just decided that we will. We will exactly this question which Pierre asked. Where do we invest our CPU hours? Do we go this way or do we go up? And we, just in discussion with the experimentalists, the way we with the others, uh, we decided to go uh, well, small gamma <coughs> aspect ratio to, to have uh, uh, well, a little bit of the algorithm regime to really understand the nature of the position. Because it, it's crucial. Because when you want to, like, uh, uh, want to, want to extrapolate to very large random number, I say, uh, are relevant in nature in the ocean, in the atmosphere, also in astrophysics, it really makes a difference whether Nussle goes like rally to the one third or whether Nussle goes like rally to the one, one half. I mean, it's a huge difference. There's an orders of magnitude uh, difference in, in the result once you are in rally numbers, say, 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 25, and you really want to know, is there such a transition? And what's the nature of this, and you want to understand this. So this is clearly is a big issue in in art. Uh, there's a, if I may, there's an implicit answer to your question. Where is this field now? It's in Europe. Winter <laughs> 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 Others is in the United States. He does his experiments in Europe. Right. But there's another issue, possibly, right? I mean, if if you want to understand nature, and if you're running up this, this, this steep incline, I mean, is there a chance to go to these extreme regimes by just looking at nature as opposed to building it in a lab? Uh, I mean, look, look I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, pushing you there because, you know, I may be high energy physics too, you know, you just, uh, you, if you really want high energies, you know, you find them, and they're out there, right? <laughs> um, well, uh, I mean, uh, many of these issues are in astrophysics, and doing measurements there is difficult. Uh, in the atmosphere, um, well, I mean, it's not control. You must, you must really have different probes, you have this geometry dependence, and you must have controlled experiments. And, uh, well, I mean, in Göttingen, uh, Günther, he built this wonderful experiment together with Eva Bodenschatz, and it's a, it's a wonderful effort. Field measurements uh, can't. Uh, and go there. Also, you don't have uh, constant driving conditions. I mean, this is this is massive. Also, with respect to uh, isolation, so heat isolation, uh, what's going on there? You you must have uh, 
the probes, you get a huge amount of data, and uh, it's really non trivial in many ways. Being one other thing that will be heard is roughness. So, to, to go a little bit lower in Rayleigh number for the argument transition, we put in some roughness. So, how does roughness change the structure? Uh, how, what is shear doing? So, what we are doing is that we apply some shear in horizontal direction to trigger the onset of this argument. I mean, transitions are always uh, very, very crucial in, in fluid dynamics. So, and here you have this very special transition uh, towards this ultimate relief, which really totally changes the transport properties if you want to understand it. And this will clearly, I mean, Eberhard says that this, uh, he, uh, at the ICTA meeting in Montreal, he gave a talk that this is what he wants to uh, devote the rest of his life to this ultimate, uh, ultimate regime and rather than not. This is uh, even an answer of that. Yes? Um, so what kind of uh, rally numbers uh, are we looking at in nature? You may be able to ask some specific questions about what we're trying to answer by looking at this. All the uh, so in so, uh, astrophysics, uh, it's uh, easily 10 to 25. Uh, in, in the atmosphere, you can get uh, 10 to 12, 10 to 14. Um, in uh, process technology, you have the challenge of quantum gets uh, very low, and then you have the transition. I mean, you saw in the space data that once you go to quantum number, uh, which is low, let's go to the last phase space here. So what you see is that for a low quantum number, right here, and uh, liquid metal has a quantum number around 0.01 down here, the onset is already earlier. And uh, I mean, the effect for the people uh, in the, the steel cooking industry, they also have heat transfer, they want to cool it down, and they, well, they, they, they can get into this regime here. So you, you, this is then the challenge is uh, low quantum number. The high quantum number is also a challenge. Uh, you go to glycerol also. And uh, is the uh, outer core of the Earth is known uh, to be a very large quantum number. In fact, this is quantum going to, to infinity. Uh, because it's so viscous as magma. And uh, there are rally numbers, typical rally numbers are also uh, about 10 to the 17. Uh, in, the core, in the Earth's core, in the liquid metal, uh, there are uh, also uh, well, Rayleigh number. Quantum number is uh, 0.02, and uh, Rayleigh number, a lot of people don't know. It's various speculations between also around 10 to 14, but even higher. So the people really don't know. We have time for one last question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this might be the other question. <laughs> <laughs> So you said that uh, when solving the uh the most expensive part is uh, solving for the pleasure. Is it the song? Okay. The song solver, yes. So uh, is there a possibility to solve for the multiplicity instead? Uh, well, I mean, you, 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 you will struggle at the multiplicity, but if you mean you must transfer a to force, I mean, you need some song equation. Because uh, it's, uh, the Ranavi Stokes equation is non local. Uh, and what well, pressure is very crucial, and uh, therefore you, you must one or the other way. Uh, you, you get the pressure, you, you must solve the constant equation. This is where I think 70 percent or 80 percent of the new time is sitting in this person. So, and uh, you really have a major effort to optimize it. 